Yeah, this new collection is uh, called Chelsea, and it's uh, designed in a way to have a very comfortable, and soft living environment. Um, and it, it, the name came actually from I was living in New York for 20 years in Chelsea, and uh, a lot of the new condominiums and, and urban living tend to be quite small now or smaller. So when you're living in a small space like this, there's certain very few things you really need today. And we're dematerializing a lot and we're having less. And in a way, less is more because you have more space. In a small space, you need space to breathe and to relax, socialize, work. So I think in this kind of soft environment is something that I've always been very interested in. To put a small, soft environment into a small apartment kind of really makes sense. If you start to have a lot of legs and a lot of objects and a lot of things sticking out, this stuff becomes awkward and becomes cluttered and in a way becomes obstacles for just really enjoying life in itself. So um, that's really how the collection came about. And it's, it, it also came about because I, for many years, believed that amorphous objects, you know, be it they uh, handle for a, for a cutlery, uh, a table that's in front of you that has rounded edges, that these things don't, in a way, become obstacles. Okay, so, so anyway, basically, so, you know, with a couch, a chair, a coffee table, a lamp, I mean, really, that's all you need in a small living environment. So, you know, Chelsea, again, has this notion of being very urban, uh, in smaller uh, living spaces, but still retaining a sense of really high quality and uh, luxury and craftsmanship within the work. So, so I called it Chelsea. The original collection that I did, uh, which I actually designed about seven, eight, nine years ago, Ottawa, was a little bit of a different approach because the approach there was to really embrace nature in a way, uh, into the forms of the objects. At the same time, it's something that I would never um, neglect is to make things extremely comfortable because at the end of the day design has to be really fluid and work for us seamlessly. So the Chelsea collection is really something you could argue is very simple, very reductive, very minimal, but not minimal in the way that we think of minimalism. When we think of minimalism we usually think of very austere form, hard-edged form, and minimalism you know, in a sense of, of its formal traits, is a rectangle, cylinder, sphere. But th these objects are more what I would call sensual minimalism, or sensualism, which is really about the human body. So they're amorphous and soft. And this is how we're born in a way, we're born in a womb. So I've always had this belief that soft objects, that our physical environment should be very um, non-obtrusive. So when you do something rounded and soft like this, what's nice about it is no matter where you touch it and you feel, you never feel like you're hurting yourself or you're, you're you know, going against, let's say, nature. Because really nature at the end of the day is completely soft and natural. And I like the, the notion of just doing things where your feet aren't necessarily hitting the bottom of a couch or a, or a, or a, um, a chair. So I, I, in a way, try a, with a lot of my work, not all of it, but I try to keep the edges of things rounded. I, I try to keep things in the sense of organic form uh, because they're an extension of us and, it's, and we are nature. So it's an extension of nature, really. I just think when something looks visually inviting and looks very human, and when objects are a bit of an extension of the human body, the first thought is that there's a mental comfort, which I think is important in space. Because if you're, even, again, if you're in a large space like this or you're in a very small space, in a small space, those objects have to feel very comfortable around you. Then when you go and interact with them, it just increases or elevates that sense of comfort, mental, then physical, and physiological. And in a way, the minute we're surrounded by comfortable things, we tend to forget uh, the objects themselves. And then at that point, we could have a better experience, be it if I was socializing right now, or if I was working, or I was sketching, or just relaxing. So I think with, you know, in, in, for me, living, dining, sleeping, all these spaces in our, our own environments just need to be a very re relaxed condition. It shouldn't be rigid. 
It should be just relaxed and engaging. You know, inspiration is a, is a funny word in a way because I'm asked this perpetually. I think I, I probably, the number one question in the world I've been asked is how are you inspired? And I, but it's good because it, it makes me really think about where my ideas are being driven from. Um, but you know, every project is completely different. So if I design a building or a, an interior or a hotel or a hospital or a shoe or a mobile phone, they have within each project, they have their own set of criteria. And for me, the criteria itself is what's most inspiring. So the minute a company or a client or somebody says to me, you know, we are trying to, this is what we want to do, this is what we want to produce, this is the space we want to develop, the, all that contemporary criteria kind of moves through my mind to kind of start to draw and sketch and come out with solutions, really. Um, but, you know, you can be inspired by many, many different things. Uh, but I think it, um, importantly is there's a difference between being inspired and being derivative. So a lot of times, and a lot, in a lot of industries, and a lot of designers, sometimes what they call inspiration is really looking at some other product. And I think the last thing I always think is, for example, if I design furniture, the last thing I should be inspired by is furniture. I should be inspired by the subject matter. What's the subject matter? Subject matter is seating, working, sleeping, relaxing, socializing. That's what needs, I, needs to inspire me. So with that said, for example, I think we live in the casual age. I call it the age of casualism, where we're wearing the most comfortable, soft, high performance running shoes. We walk around with clothes. I mean, even the suit I'm wearing is all stretch and can never wrinkle to travel. This is the new world we live in. We're, we're kind of nom becoming more and more nomadic and we're, we have good technology. So I think that the extension of that is the casual age is that our furnishings and things around us also should be in a way casual too. It should be on one hand high performance, you know, a fabric that's, let's say, fairly easy to clean or take care of. At the same time, it should be as pleasurable as wearing a really nice pair of sneakers that you feel like you're walking on air. You should feel like you're sitting on air too, you know? So, so that's, that, that's inspiring for me. And inspiring for me is, is the possibilities of what we can do in this age with uh, technology, with production methods, with materials, um, but also addressing the social human behaviors, our social human behavior. And probably that's the most inspiring. If you look around, you know, someone said to me years and years and years ago, they said that no object really needs to exist unless it adds a certain better human experience. So, uh, and I've always used that as a way of a bit of a critique of whether, you know, if I'm going to add another chair to the market, is it giving me a kind of better experience? So that, that to me is inspiring. I think as I've worked, I've worked professionally almost 35 years, I think that now it's gotten to the point where I have more ideas than I have projects. So, uh, and as soon as I hear the criteria or the moment we talk about the project, I my mind races very, very quickly. And I am very spontaneous. And I tend to immediately draw. And then immediately I can, within a day, produce 50, 60 thoughts or ideas about that subject matter. So I, I would say, for me, form follows subject. You know, what constitutes a successful designer is to listen and to collaborate. Uh, a lot of, uh, I, I, you know, I heard this, this sort of criticism towards me many times of, you know, how do you produce or you do too much? I never thought of that as kind of, I always thought that was strange. Like, why is that a criticism that I do a lot? And I think that what they were trying to say to me or a person was trying to say to me is, is you put so much on the market. And I realized why I have a lot on the market is because every company I work with, I collaborate. So it's not about me as being some, you know, creative, artistic uh, guru or something. It's me listening and working with the team, the company, the brand, the brand culture, the production methods they have, the materials, and trying to do something that fits and works within that brand culture. Now, that doesn't mean I can work with every brand. It's also why I have a bit of a vision and sensibility. But with the companies I end up working with and the ones that approach me, uh, it's, we, we tend to have a similar sensibility to begin with. And then it's a question of really trying to make a good collaboration. 
So at the end of the day, even though my name is attached to this, it takes a lot of people to make this happen. So I have to be aware that it's not me alone that's doing these things. And the more I'm receptive to collaborating, the more success I have and the more I produce. So I think that, you know, that's one thing. I think the other thing that makes a designer successful is, is that they have to constantly push themselves in a sense of putting something in the world into vision. And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of derivatives of a lot of things. So the question is, are you actually designing something or are you just reappropriating something? So we are all creating. We were all born to create in a way. And we have to, specifically the people who are creating our physical world or our vision or our virtual world, we have to really push our ideas and really think about what we're really doing to try to find original proposals. And, uh, and, I, and, and, and that takes, in a sense, an intellectual struggle. It takes a struggle from within to, and it takes a struggle to be really highly perceptive of the world around you so that you can contribute something that's original. I think furniture design in, in the next decades, and of course I, I'm a little bit biased to this, but I think things are going to become more casual and softer and more comfortable and less Cartesian, less of a grid, less of things like that's just going to be more working for our body and our lifestyles and the way we live and the way we work. I mean, you can even see things like, you know, kitchens becoming a little bit softer versus a big hard edged object. You can see this movement going on where, where we realize that, that these things around us really need to work with us, not against us. And that's interesting because man has always, I mean mankind, has always fought against nature rather than working with nature. Um, so, you know, a straight line doesn't exist in nature as an example. And yet we've created a very Cartesian world, a very hard-edged world. So I think furniture will move that way. Um, I think the second movement, in a way, you could argue, and uh, you can't see any sign of it here, but it's colored because I see that, uh, you can see that, I remember when I was really pushing color back in the mid 80s, uh, with many companies, nobody was interested in color at all. There was no proposals because what grew out of late modernism was modern, modern, monochromatic world. And a lot of architects and interior design, everybody was kind of staying away from this notion of color. Even the notion of decoration or ornament was really the wrong thing. And now you can see very quickly uh, that color is becoming part of everyday life. And you can, and I find it fascinating that you can buy a professional Nikon camera in hot pink, which goes to show you that color is not relegated anymore to children or to, right? Or even that pink is relegated to, to, to women, you know? So I think color is going to be a big, a big step. I think the next thing is sustainability. I think the next, you know, the movement is we've been talking about it for a long time now. But the reality is I think that there's going to be more and more mandates on companies globally <clears throat> with some really maybe possibly global sanctions of making sure that everything that we're putting into the world is self-sustainable. So we're going to be using much more ecological product and we're going to take a lot of toxins out of this world. And a lot of the furniture industry has been full of toxins and full of, of, of uh, the manufacturing process that have not been really a good thing for the world that we live in today. So, and I know, for example, that Bo Concept has taken many steps in that, and I think we're going to take, uh, Bo Concept is going to have to take more, and many, many companies are, are going to have to. I think they're going to be obligated, really. And so, so sustainability is the next movement. I think the last movement I just want to add to that is, and I talked about it a little bit earlier, is addressing the kind of casual age. You know, office furniture is no longer office. And all these things are breaking down to the point where, you know, like running around every day in jeans or, or wearing, you know, high performance soft sneakers or wearing things that stretch or, you know, the formalities of the world have changed. You know, even, even you'll see Wall Street soon, well, they will not wear a tie. The tie is finished. All these things are disappearing. And the reason they're disappearing is because we know better. You know, we're realizing that we're, we're, 3D human beings that have to like, you know, work all day, do things all day, you know, and, and 
the, the notion of the uniform, packaging yourself in some sort of uniform to play some sort of role in the profession is going to dissipate in a way. So I like this notion of casual age. And you can see with youth culture, exactly that's what's happening. There's no, no question about it. So uh, that's, and it's kind of the world that I want to live in in a way I realize. I never liked the idea of, of really formalities or, or even what we call traditions and rituals that are not really rituals and traditions. I think those things can disappear, a lot of them, because we end up shaping new traditions. We shape new or new rituals. And we can move on and progress as human beings. And hence why I, was, I find it strange when we, we go into these interior spaces and we see, you know, what they call bespoke spaces or somebody's playing with Baroque or Rococo or the past. Or they have nothing to do with the world we live in. The world we live in now should be an electric bicycle or car. It's your smartphone. This is the, this is the age we live in. And I think our interior spaces and our furnishings and our environments are all going to have to catch up to that. It's almost like if you think about the digital age, it's so highly experiential and so connected and so global and no borders and no boundaries and all these things. And the physical world is still somehow steeped in the 20th century. So we're in the 21st century, which almost 20 years into it, and it has to catch up with the digital. You know, my, my design process is really, uh, I, I was called the process of my, what I do is just in my brain, really, meaning that the minute I get excited about a project, I get excited about the opportunity of doing something new, the opportunity of putting something in the world that I'm gonna hopefully increase the pleasure and well-being of others. Because design, I think, can be a very selfless act that way. You have to think about others. It's not like a painter. You know, a painter is a very selfish person. An artist, I always say, is the most selfish profession in the world. You wake up in the morning, you do whatever you like, right? You, of course, you have to find a way to struggle or survive or do well, but you basically do what you like. As a designer, there's that border of one hand, you're trying to do the things you like, at the same time, you have to appease many others. So if you design a, a design, I, mean, I know the Ottawa chair today has sold over 70,000 of them. The reason that chair is because it's designed for people. It's designed for living. So, um, so my process anyway, in my mind, I quickly generate a lot of thoughts and ideas. And based on my experiences, and your question about inspiration is that really in a way it's Inspiration is based on all experiences you've had. Really. So, uh, accumulatively speaking, my mind races and I immediately start seeing all the opportunities. Like a lot of times when there's a lot of criteria and a lot of restrictions, I'm even more creative. And then I just start drawing. And my process is still very, let's say, fundamental since the Renaissance. I draw a lot. And it could be a finger on an iPad, it doesn't matter. It could be my pen on my iPad, it could be a sketchbook, it could be a pencil, it could be a thick marker, anything that's going to take this and get it out before I forget. And once it's out, then I have a few teams, I sit with, I have a few industrial designers, a few graphic designers, a few architects, a few interior designers. I sit with them and I share my sketches, and I share my ideas, and we start to develop the project. But at that point, we live in this age we live in. Software is so beyond now what I can draw. There's a time when I could draw better. I mean, I had to draw really well to, to, to communicate an idea. Now the software, 3D software is what we use so beyond what I can sketch that I wanted to go to the computer immediately so I can start to now sit in front of the computer and start to really make manifest the project. Creativity. Creativity is uh, interesting because I, my philosophy is very simple. We're only on this earth to create. In other words, to be is to create. That's why we exist. And I'm not saying that because I am a designer. We procreate to have children. That's a form of being something original. Or we intellectually create. We create a plane that can fly. We, we create a ship. We create a, the wheel. We create a microchip, etc. So that's why we're all here in a way. And that involves humanity. So one in a sense you could argue is to keep human beings surviving by having children. 
That's one form of creation. The other form of creation is intellectual progress and evolution. So, um, so we're here to create. That's my simple. And how, how, how do we create? Well, the minute we're born as a child, the minute you put a pen in a child's hand or, or paint, they want to create or they want to make something. So hence, that's who we are. That's who all of us are. You know, and it's sadly a lot of the professions and a lot of forms of survival suppress creativity, um, which is a shame. But I think now we're moving into what I call the creative epoch, where we're becoming more empowered to be creative. We're given the free tools to create, and, a, and we have a voice and an opportunity now that's democratic or globally. Um, in a sense of originality, well, since we all have a different fingerprint, hence our creations can be all original. So we're all completely different on this planet, which means we have the opportunity to create something that like no one else has ever thought about or done before. So the functionality is, I think the, the world is, gonna, is becoming more and more and more functional. I, I, I went through a period where I really disliked some of the work I did because I was seduced by this idea that design is animated and strong and full of personality and my voice and I lack sometimes to make something really work. For me, I realize now is if something doesn't work, it looks good for a moment, we we'll get a lot of PR, and then it's over very, very quickly. Because things, once they get into people's homes and they have to enjoy them, or offices or spaces, whatever, if the things work really well, they love the work even more so. I mean, identity is very linked, and you could argue symbiotic to originality. So uh, I think when we do something original, we speak of our identity. We show our differentiation in the world. You know, I, I, I've been preaching this for 25 years that we have to do away with the differences of how we saw humanity. And the way we, we separate humanity is through this notion of territory, race, religion, color, creed, but the only thing that really separates all of us is the fact that we're all different. That's it. So as the boundaries and borders disappear, and hopefully nationalism disappears, and jingoism disappears, <clears throat> and um, patriotism disappears, and racism disappears, eventually we're just left with what? The difference between her and I, you and I, you and uh, her and you, that's it. And that's our identity, each one of us. You know, design, you know, I think asking the question of the purpose of design is the best question you can ever ask, actually, because there's a lot of designers in the world, there's a lot of us making and uh, producing a lot of things. Um, I think the purpose of design is to just, at the end of the day, make a better human experience, make a better life for everyone. And, you know, I, I'm included in this, but many designers at the end of the day aren't necessarily doing that. We tend to forget that. We either become sometimes too much of a formless, we get preoccupied with things that are not necessarily making your and my life better. But that's my agenda now. It's been my agenda for the last 10, 10 years or so in a rigorous way, and that's what I just want to move forward with.